Welcome to our video series spotlighting astronomical league observing programs. Today we focus on the Active Galactic Nuclei program with program coordinator Al Limperti. Al, would you like to tell us about this very fascinating and different program? Yeah, I'm very happy to do so. I have a very short uh, power, uh, PowerPoint uh, describing uh, how we came about uh, uh, making this program uh, and some hints on how to participate. And, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find it very enjoyable. Back in the uh, mid uh, 2000s, I uh, had an idea of, of making an, a, a, uh, an observing program dealing with uh, the active uh, galactic nuclei. So let me just first describe what our active galactic nuclei are. The first uh, type of active galactic nuclei are quasars, which is a shortened version of quasar uh, stellar radio source. And these are very far away, uh, very old objects, and uh, very powerful in emitting uh, at least light and other types of radiation that are uh, much brighter even of our own galaxy. And it's thought that the quasar is the, very, is the bright center of a galaxy and powered by a, a very huge uh, black hole. The second type of active galactic nucleus is the BL Lacerda objects, which were founded in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, this type of object is also uh, in a very intense uh, uh, powerhouse of radiation, and but it's a different, differs from the quasars in that its optical spectrum is kind of featureless, whereas the quasar spectrum uh, does have uh, a lot of features to it. Uh, the third type of, um, of uh, active galactic nucleus is the uh, Seifert galaxies. Uh, these were first discovered in, in the 1940s, but it was only more recently that uh, these galaxies are uh, really quite active in emitting a lot of types of radiation. And they do have uh, nuclei uh, that are very similar to quasars. Uh, they're also very far away and very luminous and, uh, and emitting a whole source of uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the thing about Seifert galaxies is that they have a very high surface brightness uh, so that we can actually uh, see the galaxy itself. Their spectrum differs in that it has very strong uh, emission lines. And it's also um, uh, because they're uh, galaxies, we can actually see the host of this active galactic nucleus, whereas the host galaxies of quasars or in Beta Lacerda objects the BL Lacerda objects are hard to see. Now, what uh, uh, intrigued me about the quasars, the uh, BL Lacerda objects, and, and Seifert galaxies is that they are very, very far away. And uh, as such, it makes it a, a nice challenge uh, to observe or image them. One thing about quasars is that uh, sometimes they, the light from that one quasar can be split and form a gravitationally lens quasar, which Einstein had predicted uh, with his general theory of relativity. And so the light from that one quasar can be split uh, into uh, two or more uh, spots that are uh, then magnified for us to see. And we could uh, probably see this uh, better on the next slide. I have a nice diagram that I found. But we know that the lens quasars come from a single source since the spectrum of each one of those split or lens objects uh, is uh, identical. And in this uh, diagram, we have, here's the Earth. Uh, here's the source of the quasar. And the light from that quasar is uh, in direct line with, with us on Earth, and that light is bent uh, around the, uh, that uh, galaxy, and due to the gravitational 
force of that galaxy, that light is bent. And as you can see depicted, we can see four spots on the left over here that are coming from a single source. So we see it as four spots, but it's a single source. Now notice that uh, some of the pathways are a little bit longer than others. This one here takes a little bit longer time to get from the quasar to us. Maybe uh, up to four months later, we'll actually see the light as opposed to uh, this one that's coming a little more directly uh, uh, towards us. So the lens quasars are kind of a neat thing to observe and image. One of the more famous ones is Einstein's cross in Pegasus. Um, you can see the little haze, uh, the foreground galaxy, and that can be seen with a, a telescope uh, uh, given good transparency. Uh, whether you see uh, one, two, or four parts of that cross depends on the, the seeing and the steadiness of the sky. A larger aperture and, uh, and, uh, and good dark skies uh, will enable you to see the light that left like uh, 8 billion years ago. So it's uh, just seeing those specks of light is, is quite amazing. More recently, there's a, a a quasar in Andromeda called a parachute quasar uh, because of the uh, shape of the four uh, spots. And uh, I was able to see two of those four from a very dark sky, uh, high magnification and a large telescope. Uh, but what amazed me is that the, the light I was looking at left about 11.4 billion years ago. That's quite, quite amazing. So there's some challenges out there. Now, uh, there are two double quasars, that is, uh, quasars that are just happen to be near each other. The spectrum of each of those is different, so we know it's not a lens quasar. So there's a list of, uh, of double quasars, much like there's a list of double star. And when we uh, come up with this list of, uh, of active galactic nuclei, I found a list uh, from Wolfgang Steinecke. Uh, and there's the website. And uh, he uh, put together a nice list that are brighter than about 16 and a half magnitude in, in the uh, minus 20 degrees north declination so that uh, we can, at least in the northern hemisphere, see most of these or image most of those. And for the Seifert galaxies, uh, there are several types of Seifert galaxies. We're not going to go into them. Uh, and subtypes, but we uh, got that list of Seifert galaxies from the NASA Ext Extra Galactic Database and using the same parameters as Wolfgang Steinecke, north uh, of minus 20 degrees and 16 and a half magnitude. Uh, we made up uh, a, uh, a spreadsheet uh, of uh, active galactic nuclei. We've got three uh, uh, tabs. One is uh, by right ascension, the second is by magnitude, and the third is by constellation. And looking at the right ascension one, here are two quasars, uh, and they're listed in alphabetical order. We give the right ascension and declination of each, the redshift, uh, the Z value, the magnitude, the page in the first edition of Uranometria, the page in the second edition of Uranometria, and the page in the millennium for those who uh, still use uh, uh, star atlases. And we give also the distances in millions of light years. So you can see these two are four and a half billion light years and almost one and a half billion light years out. Part of the confusing thing is that some of these objects have multiple names and we, we listed their aliases as well. But the primary ones are listed in the left-hand column. By magnitude, we got the, some of the brighter ones, like a little over 12th magnitude. Uh, 3C 273 is a famous one in Virgo. That's a quasar. There's another bright uh, BL object that's also as bright. And, uh, and their distances are given as well. But if you prefer to go uh, hunt these things down by constellation, you can just click on the constellation tab and, and see the ones that are listed by constellation. Now, I do have some uh, uh, strategies uh, for observing these. 
some of the requirements. The most, the basic one is uh, you have to be a member of the Astronomical League, either through uh, an astronomy club or a member at large. That's almost a given for almost any uh, observing club. And you're to observe or image uh, 30 quasars, secret galaxies, or BLOs for the uh, 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 certificate and pen. And rather than doing 100, as many other programs are, we chose 30. And to appreciate the types of active galactic nuclei, we ask that you observe or image five quasars of these five Cefer galaxies and two uh, BL Lacerda objects. If you have seen M81, M61, and M104, you have seen uh, three of those five Cefer galaxies already. And if you are so inclined, you can uh, choose a lens quasar or a double quasar from the list that's available on the Astronomical League site. And you can either use a telescope and uh, visually record or uh, verbally describe your uh, observation or sketch it or image it. And you can either do it manually or with digital setting circles or go to telescopes or even a remote telescopes. And uh, as long as you uh, meet those requirements, uh, you qualify for certification. Now, here are a couple of strategies I want to share with you. Uh, one is star hopping, the other would be digital setting circles. Uh, some of us still do uh, star hopping. And if you do do that, uh, what I've done is made a, a worksheet listing the object I want to see. Uh, the constellation that it's in, the magnitude, and any uh, hints that will uh, make my observing time more efficient. Listing the page of the atlas that I might have in either Millennium or the Uranometria. And here I indicate a caster, which is a nice bright star in Gemini. Uh, looking at that, at least this one object, and star hop, we can go from caster in about two and a half degrees east of caster is that uh, quasar and notice that it has a different name but uh, that's one of its aliases and it's right near a nice small galaxy ngc 2535 so if you want to plug that in your digital setting circle you'll have that quasar uh, in the same field another source for uh, star hopping or at least imaging anyway is a free download from uh, alvin huey his website famefuzzies.com and there is the uh, the URL on the bottom. He lists 66 active galactic nuclei. Uh, he lists them as variable galaxies. And yes, some of these uh, AGNs do vary in, in magnitude. And uh, so he listed 66. And in there, he for each one, he's got two pages. One is a Telrad view, a finder view, and a eyepiece view, as well as image view of, of these active galactic nuclei. And a neat thing, it's a, it's a nice resource. You can download it, bring it to your famous print shop, and have it spiral bound if you wish. The other strategy is using digital setting circles. Uh, many of us use that. I have um, uh, Uranium Argo Navis, and I made a text file uh, that I uploaded to my Argo Navis, and I uh, started each uh, quasar with QS, each lens quasar with QSL, and each BL Lacerda object with BLO. And so I can just dial uh, a particular one in, uh, the Argo Navis, and it uh, already have the right of ascension and, and declination. And if everything is lined up right, you should get that object in the field of view. To help me put this together, uh, three members of the Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers, uh, we met over a supper and a beer or two uh, to, to discuss this and, uh, and refine it. And so I thank John, Mark, and Vince for that. Uh, Frank and Joe uh, helped me uh, with uh, some of the images uh, and uh, discussing what minimum aperture. And we listed on the Astronomical League website a minimum aperture of 13 inches, particularly if you're uh, imaging, uh, that should be uh, uh, fine. But dark skies uh, would be uh, uh, a big plus. 
uh, Dick Steinberg, and also a member of our club, provided the images that I used on a certificate, and I'll show you that in, in a moment. When I was looking for uh, what the pin should look like, I f found on a NASA website a nice uh, drawing of a uh, of a quasar, and it, it acknowledged Aurora Simonet of the Sonoma University. So I contacted her, Googled her, found her uh, email, and she gave permission to use her image on uh, uh, as a pen. I did send her a pen as an acknowledgement. And this is what the uh, uh, certificate looks like. Uh, we all know Aaron Clevinson. Uh, he got certificate number two back in uh, 2015. Uh, here's a picture of double quasar in Ursa Major. This is a lens quasar. And this is 3C273 in, in Virgo. Uh, that was the first one I ever saw with a 13-inch telescope. And so that's a, a nice grab. And the uh, current Astronomical League president usually uh, has a signature back in 2015, this president was JJG. I guess he's any, some relation to our host over here. And this is what the pin looks like. There's the uh, uh, drawing that Aurora had made, and we just added Astronomical League and Active Galactic Nuclei to it. So why observe these Active Galactic Nuclei? Well, uh, first off, uh, it adds a, certainly another dimension to your repertoire in your uh, in your 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 database, uh, you may be a little tired of seeing the same old same old and looking for something new and very different. Uh, this is it. Uh, it definitely increases your observing skills if you're a visual observer. If you're an imager. It will increase your imaging skills as well. And as I mentioned earlier, there are some of these are variable in in brightness in the Association of American Variables Star Observers, AAVSO, will welcome your information because there are about 211 variable AGNs out there and they would appreciate any data that you might have. And they do have finder charts on their website for these so you can compare uh, nearby known uh, stars with known uh, magnitudes with the magnitude of the AGN. It definitely adds more wow factor to your observing session. And, uh, and I'll share with you a couple of uh, people who had sent me their uh, uh, wow factors after they had done the program. Uh, here's one of them. Uh, uh, he was very uh, uh, blown away by the distances that these AGNs are. Uh, he learned a lot. Uh, he enjoyed the program so much, he's going to give a talk to his local club. And, uh, and that's another way to spread the word as well. Uh, the second person thought that uh, the coolest was the very last one he saw that was about 12.2 billion light year travel time. And uh, even though he stared at it for an hour and a half, he did see it and then, then it, it went away. So he had a great deal of patience and uh, he said, wow, also. And so that that's... Uh, who I'd like to share with you. And lastly, you are definitely pushing the envelope in whether you're imaging or visually observing. So I'd like to leave you with, uh, when you do see these little points of light, there may be uh, not much to uh, write home about or, or it's not uh, artistically uh, uh, looking like the Orion Nebula or, or Horsehead. But think of those, some of those points of light have left even before, before our own solar system uh, was developed. So uh, uh, please enjoy the adventure, uh, enjoy the challenge of doing it, and enjoy the sense of accomplishment, which I know I did, and enjoy the immensity of the universe, which I'm sure uh, is uh, the thrust of this whole program. Well, th th thank you, thank you, Al. Um, I have a couple of comments and questions on on this. Maybe you could you could help clarify a few things. Um, because these objects are so dim, uh, th that this is not a beginner's program. Uh, you should have some uh, a lot of observing under your belt already, especially of galaxies. 
what what people are afraid of is that they, they they're, they're worried about how am I going to find this thing, and 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 what is what it's going to look like. So I, the way I see it is that on, on locating its spot in the sky is no different than than finding a much brighter Herschel galaxy, for instance. It's the same way. It's the same star, star chart. It's the same star hopping or galaxy hopping, whichever it may be. But the real issue is, will you actually see it? Because these things, or a lot of these things are dim. You know, you're talking 14, 15, 16th magnitude. So you, you're going to have to have, as you said, dark skies, um, a large enough aperture, and the um, skill to, to star hop, galaxy hop to, to these particular objects. It, uh, that's how you see it, right? Is it, or, or am I wrong in assuming that? Right. And what helps is if you're uh, doing visual or later, if you're imaging, you can always sit down and compare your image to one that uh, you find either in, a, in an atlas or on the Internet. And uh, you'd be surprised. You, I've, I've seen uh, people uh, submit uh, their AGN programs, their images, and they have other galaxies in there. I said, you know what you might want to do sometime on a rainy night? is to label those galaxies, find right. what, what they're called, and add them to your database. And, right. uh, and But it, it, comparing your image, your sketch, your visual description, or at least have a picture there with you uh, uh, so you know you're in the right spot, you know you're looking at the right one. That, that, that's a very helpful technique to do it that way because it'll help clear up any... Oh, any misidentifications that right, that right. you may get. Now, I also noticed that here I was, I was just saying, you know, they're 14th, 15th, and 16th magnitude, but there are a number of them which are fairly bright. And as you were right. saying, Seifert galaxies tend to have a high surface brightness. Right, right. So you got M81, uh, M104, and there was another messy, I, I didn't write that down, but... Um, M61. So, yeah, okay. So there are some that, but anyone, anyone could get if they have a dark sky. And right, so, right. Yeah, so th th those might be uh, good ones to start out on. That that's pretty fascinating, I think. You know, and you're talking about the the wow factor. Uh, for for me, I'd be thinking with what what these other people had said on how far away these are. You know, we, we, here I am with my little telescope. I am looking many billions of light years in 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 the distant past. That that's pretty cool, I think. Or, and sometimes it's it's numbing. You you can't. You kind of lose the wow factor after a while. It becomes so matter of fact. Okay, ten million, uh, you know, two billion light years. Okay, that was kind of neat. And then, uh, but you keep pushing and pushing until you get, uh, you know, further and further away. Then, yeah. it, then it becomes quite meaningful. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's very humbling. Yeah, and then you turn around and, and you look at some of these Messier galaxies that are only you know, 50 million light years away, and you're going, ah, oh, yeah, so what? Yeah, <laughs> but even yeah. that's pretty incredible by itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're really pushing the envelope to go further than that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that, that, that's pretty cool. And um, Thank you, Al, for, for taking your time to present this to us and putting it together. I, I think a, a lot of our members like looking at, at these videos because they, they, they do get a, a helping hand, so to speak, you know, uh, we we try to give them encouragement and show them how to do stuff. They might be thinking, "Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that." But rest, keep this in mind that people have done this. And I know Al lives here on the East Coast. You don't have to be in the Western United States to see these. You got to have clear, dark skies. But there are places on the East Coast to find these and do some really serious, uh, rewarding observing. Keep that in mind. I can tell you, the last. Certificate that I uh, sent out last week. Uh, he did all his imaging from his driveway in Delaware. Ah, at Bortel Six. <laughs> well, guys. Yeah. Bortel Six. Okay. Well, there, there you go. Yeah, yeah. You do a lot I don't of know. magic. You, and, you're kind of putting me on the spot now because I think I, I'm under about Bortel Four or maybe three and a half at best. I don't know. So maybe I got to try this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See how that works out. But and again, uh, th thank you for, for your time and uh, joining us on this, this whole video series. We haven't held one of these sessions in a while, but uh, we've probably done 15 of them all over various um, Astronomical League observing programs. This one, I think, might be the one that really tests you the most on it. But yeah. give it a try if you can and never be discouraged by this stuff because you got to start someplace.
the more you observe, the better that you're going to get. You're really going to improve your observing skills. Okay, Al, uh, I'll thank you again. I appreciate it. And we will be seeing everybody out there on YouTube uh, sometime in the near future. So thank you for joining in. All See right. you. Thank you. All right.